Buyer Beware Buying model steam engines via a photograph on the internet Part 1 Even an experienced buyer with an experienced eye can still be fooled when buying an engine via the internet from a photograph From the seller's point of view it's not camera trickery but you can take a photograph in such a way that things look much better than they actually are Take this engine as an example, it's really beautiful It's a twin tandem compound engine and one could say that this would be a really good addition to any miniature steam engine collection. The general build standard of the engine is quite good. The engineering is not perfect, but things seldom are. It's to a good standard. This belongs to a customer who left it with me a few years ago, and it's been sat on the shelf ever since. I really must contact him and get him to pick this and some other engines up, because they're in the way. Have you spotted what's wrong with this engine? Look, it's got a special feature. It's got a split crankshaft. Both ends of the crankshaft can go in opposite directions. And that's because the crankshaft was assembled by the look of it using Loctite. No pins, just Loctite. And pardon the pun, but the Loctite is no longer locking tightly. The problem is, the time it would take to fix this is going to make it very expensive to do so. And I don't think it's worth it. The overall build standard is good, but not all that good, so it's just been left on the shelf. Here's another steam engine that belongs to the same customer. He was going to open a steam museum, but it didn't work out. So what's this and what's wrong with it? Well, it's a Stuart Beam engine, and it was partially disassembled when I got it. Casting a cursory glance over the build quality, this isn't good. Look how the holes are not in the right place, so they've been elongated, to allow it to be bolted to the casting. And what about this super scale tap? Well, it would be super scale if this was a massive big steam engine. The tap's not a big problem, that would just be discarded and I would fit a normal small one. Have you spotted that the drain cocks are missing? The cylinder needs dismantling and drilling to take drain cocks, because it will look much better with the drain cocks than without them. And look at the state of the main bearing, I don't know what's going on here. This really is a rattle fit. The connecting rod needs a bit of rust removal and generally cleaning up, but it looks like it's made OK. The turning standard on the flywheel rim is not very good, so the flywheel needs attention as well. And that's even before I look inside the cylinder and inside the valve chest. From my point of view, it's hardly worth fixing this engine. For what I would have to charge for the amount of time it would take, it's an impractical proposition for me. And the next one. Now this one is a bit of a mess, but this is not all workmanship, this was damaged in the post. As you can see from this clip, the top of the standard that holds the cylinder has snapped off. So how did this come to be snapped off? Well there's a bit of a weird design with the number 10. When you sit it on the bench like this, the flywheel is slightly longer than the box bed that it sits on. And in the package there was quite a lot of weight on the cylinder of this engine, so I think that's what happened. The parcel got dropped and the shock broke off the cylinder complete with the bit of the standard. And from this shock damage from being badly handled in the post I wouldn't be surprised if the crankshaft is also bent. Whenever you work on Stuart double tens it's really important to make sure that you sit them on a piece of plywood so that the flywheel doesn't bottom on your workbench. Please do not write in and tell me to use JB Weld on this part because I'm not going to do it. It would probably fix it, but I really don't do bodgers. Let's have a look at the cylinder. Well, here it is, and the piston is fitted into the cylinder. No piston ring, just the oil grooves as per the plan. And the piston's quite a good fit in the cylinder. Looking at the engineering standard of the box bed, the sole plate and the standards, I was very surprised to find this. Whoever drilled the steamways from the edge of the cylinder down to the ports Got it very wrong, because instead of the drill breaking through into the ports, it came through the port face. This is a very common problem if you're a beginner. I've seen it many, many times. And here's the other cylinder, same problem. That's where it came through the port face, and then it came through the port face, and halfway through the port. It would be quite difficult to time the slide valve on this engine. Not impossible, but once again, it's a bit of a bodge. And it gets better. This is the exhaust pipe. I mean, look at the state of this. The commercial plumbing fittings by the look of it. And they're really badly made. They should look like this. This is a Stuart double 10 with the proper exhaust manifold. 
and this is the one on this engine, not very good. I'm fairly certain that the person who made the body of the engine, the standards, the bed plate and the sole plate, also made the steam chests and the steam chest covers, but then someone else at a later date must have drilled the steamways incorrectly in the cylinders and fitted the hideous exhaust piping and inlet piping. Similarly, if you look at the lower cylinder covers with the gland nuts, this is good model engineering and they appear to look very well made. And as I mentioned earlier, the main body of the engine really is well made. The eccentrics, the flywheel, the crankshaft, no problem at all. Other than maybe from the impact that the postal service gave the engine. Here's another double 10 V and I featured this in a video a while back. This was bought via the internet by a friend of mine and he gave it to me. It didn't run very well, it was very lumpy and there was a lot of play in the crankshaft which was actually screwed together and loctited and it had all come loose. So I made a video about this engine a good while back. Here's an excerpt from that video. I would not build a crankshaft like this. This is really horrible. Anyway, as I've said earlier, for the purpose of the video only, I'm putting this back together. It is of course vitally important that these cranks are at 90 degrees to each other and you can do this in the lathe using a couple of set squares. Alternatively you can of course make a jig to do this. Very shortly I will be making a video about making a crankshaft for the Stuart twin launch engine that I'm working on. And I must say immediately it will not be made like this. It will be built up, but built up properly. And still going through the motions, I'm now going to fit a taper pin to pin the crankshaft to the crank webs. You can of course press in a parallel pin. But I just thought I would take this opportunity to show how to use a taper reamer and why you use a taper reamer and how not to break a taper reamer when fitting a taper pin. Be careful how far you go through the hole with a taper reamer because if you go too far through the hole the taper pin will also go too far through the hole and come out the other side. So as you do this job try the pin in place frequently. In this demonstration I'm showing that I need the thicker part of the taper pin to go into the crank web but not the very end of it because it is a little bit too big. Eventually when the hole is the right size I'm applying a drop of Loctite 603. Now for taper pins you do not need to do this, in fact you should never do it. But in this small crankshaft it's a good idea because I don't want it to ever come out. Now all I need to do is shorten the pin and I do this by putting it on the bandsaw and cutting the pin at both sides so it's almost flush with the crank web. I'm not going too close to the crank web because I don't want to mark it with the blade. Once the pin is cut to the correct length to suit the crank web, I first of all cleaned it up on my one inch belt sander, which is much easier than doing it this way, but I finished it off with some wet or dry sandpaper. So has it worked? Um, well sort of. It feels a little bit better. One or two of the other junctions are a bit loose. After the part was cleaned up, I put it in my lathe to spin it and see how true it was. And oh look, the part at the right hand side is running really true. The bit that I didn't show was the hitting it with the soft hammer to get it to be true. And if you look at the middle bit, it's anything but true. Since I made that video, it's been online and it's had a lot of hits. And I've had a lot of comments, a lot of bad comments and a lot of good comments. The most common stupid comment that occurs frequently is, well, it was all right until you took it apart, but that's just ignorance personified. There are lots of things wrong with this engine. Even the connecting rods are not the same length. And the other common comment that I get on this video is, why don't you weld the crankshaft? That'll fix it. I don't think I mentioned in the previous video about the crack in the casting. Can you see it at the bottom here? I'll just scratch the paint off so you can see it more clearly. Okay then, I'll give in before I get the comments. This could easily be fixed with JB Weld. And JB Weld is very good and would fix this because this part of the standard is not a highly stressed component. So this is the end of part one. I recommend that you also watch part two. When you buy online, looking at a photograph, you really do need to know what to look for. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.